Okay, welcome everybody. Um, it is my great honor to introduce our 60th president of the History of Education Society, Professor Yoon K. Pak. Yoon has been my colleague and friend for over 20 years since we were graduate students together at the University of Washington. And she has continually pushed my thinking over those years. This afternoon, I would like to argue that Yoon Pak is the president we need at this historical moment. Her leadership, both in HES and her university has been essential as we work to navigate challenges to our democracy and move forward to the next 60 years of the organization. Uh, from my observations over the years, Yoon possesses several qualities and dispositions that make her a visionary leader for our times. First, she is intellectually curious and willing to follow the archival evidence in order to excavate the histories and prevent the erasure of the lives and experiences of students, teachers, and educational leaders of color. Her chance discovery of a stash of letters to a Seattle teacher that she stumbled upon in the University of Washington archives ended up as a book project on the contradictions between democratic citizenship education and the internment of Japanese American school children during World War II. Her research on Asian Americans in higher education, the intercultural education movement, and her new study, which she will discuss today, exemplify this willingness to follow the evidence and uncover histories that haven't been told. Second, Yoon is collaborative and interdisciplinary as a scholar, a stance that is not readily adopted by those who do historical work. She envisions that history should include the lives of everyday people and that by working together with others, we might produce a broader understanding and better histories. Third, Yoon is self-reflective about her own scholarship and willing to interrogate, in, interrogate her own judgment regarding past research and consider new understandings. Fourth, Yoon thinks deeply about constructions of race and challenges us to go beyond racial binaries regarding uh, and consider systemic racializ racialization and racism from multiple perspectives. Fifth, Yoon is generous with her time and has been a dedicated mentor to a generation of aspiring historians of education at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign and in HES. And I know several of you are in the audience today. Several of those scholars have gone on to become faculty members at colleges and universities across the country and members of this organization. To provide just one example, a course assignment on conducting and teaching oral histories became a book project that provided an outlet for mentoring and publications for her graduate students. And finally, Yoon is unafraid and willing to ask the hard questions that challenge us as academics to move beyond complacency and complicity in order to change our higher education institutions and to make them more just. Her talk today, Racist Blind by Design, illustrates these qualities, but it is also a call to action. I also think Yoon is hopeful about the future and believes that we might transform our institutions and support the next generation of historians of education. There are no guarantees regarding institutional and organizational change, but as Stuart Hall notes, we must struggle where we are. I'm grateful that we have Professor Yoon Pak as our HES president to lead the way. Please join me in welcoming Yoon as she presents her presidential lecture. Wow, thank you. Gee, Lori, I didn't know you thought of me that way, <laughs> right? And I'm, I always like to bring a level of uh, levity to what I do, of course, what I'm going to talk about, I hope ruffles some feathers, but that's kind of the point of why we're here and what we do in our everyday work. You can also see that I'm coming to you as Lori Johnson. So if something goes wrong, you can blame Lori Johnson for that or Chris Van, right? So I wanna to talk to you today about obviously this topic that, uh, that came about in a way that I'll describe 
how do we really work to think through this notion of racist blind by design, confronting our educational past, present, and future? But this is our present. Welcome to this world that we have. And thankfully, we have a new declared president of the United States as of my time, 1037 Central Time, which Joe Biden declared the winner of the presidential race. And now Kamala Harris as the first black and Asian female vice president. Of course, amidst the fury of text messages that was going around at the time, I couldn't finalize the elements of the presidential address, but I would say that was for good reason. But there are still ways that we need to think through in this moment, right? And how we got here. Here we are. We still face a divided country, largely based on race. We have millions of cases, 10 million cases of COVID-19, record number of reaching 100,000 plus a day now and over 230,000 deaths. And so many of you have been experiencing this on a personal level. So thank you for that. Thank you for navigating through those challenges. And of course, we can't forget over the summer, especially global protests over anti-Black racism and systemic inequalities that have marshaled new and renewed calls for permanent reforms in all facets of society. And we even found in rural pockets of America, right? There are protests in support of Black Lives Matter. But yet all these ways that we are noticing current day events, we know through some of our histories, right? History tells us of the progress and fallback from civil unrest. With increased gains came virulent white backlash. But like with any efforts at systemic reform, the question we really have to ask, and I'm so grateful to Dr. Edmund Gordon for providing that opening plenary. What are we gonna do this time, right? How are we gonna make it different? And most importantly for us, and this is also for myself as well, how will we work to confront our own racist blind practices? And dare we say complicity in perpetuating inequality, either directly or, ind or indirectly. This is the work, the hard work that must come. And certainly, as historians, your research has demonstrated and evidenced disparities in educational opportunities and outcomes ever since we started researching the history of schooling and education. You've also traced its historical origins to contemporary policies and practices where we're witnessing continued glaring inequalities, not just in the United States, but elsewhere around the world. This is a global issue. And while it is not my intent to suggest as did George Counts, but maybe I am, Dare schools build a new social order? I'm imploring us to work collectively and systematically to dismantle institutional practices intentionally designed to maintain systemic inequality. Perhaps it begins first and foremost, as I've alluded to, with a critical reflection of our own complicity in this process, embedded in historical traditions designed for certain groups of, cert certain groups of students to fail all of us who are here have been beneficiaries to get to this point, but we also know with varying degrees of privilege. So my approach in this address is to facilitate a process of inner reflection towards outward action. I draw from scholarship in the fields of history, education, ethnic studies, sociology, and philosophy, as well as revisiting some of the primary sources to lay out an argument for why confronting racist blind institutional practice is necessary and long overdue. And what I offer today is a conceptual reframing to help make sense, well, at least for me, of what has resurfaced in this dual pandemic moment of COVID-19 and systemic racism. Hence this address, which is still in its developmental stages, so you gotta forgive me here, right? It will continue in formulation, adding in critical relevant research within the final stages. And so with that, this is an unconventional year, okay? And it requires an unconventional presidential address. But also, this is important to recognize, this is the 60th year marking the anniversary of the History of Education Society and how wonderful it is that I come to close out 
as I call the first 60 years of this society. And it also reminded me of the historical, traditional, cultural importance of what 60 years means, right? And in particular for East Asian cultures, and certainly I come from a culture in my Korean household where turning 60 was a huge deal. I wish we had fireworks and a huge party, and perhaps we will get to that point. But it also is marking a sense of reflection, a renewal, and a rebirth, right? So it's also, how do we want to remake ourselves in a way, given how we mark the past? And with that, I also want to acknowledge those who have been former presidents of our great society. And just look at these names, right? And from the very first of Lawrence Kremen, who really made the field of history of education, arguably, but I would say with strong evidentiary basis for that, but all the presidents in between who have helped us in so many ways to get to where we are and to get to where I am. It is also important how we got here. So many of us had so much help. And as Dr. Johnson alluded to in my introduction, families, friends, mentors. And I can't say enough about my being at the University of Illinois was because of people like Nancy Beattie, of Donna Kerr, of Debbie Kurdeman. So I come from a very strong, I would say a social foundationalist background because of that training. Also, President Ronald Rashan, who I met in 1997 at Washington State University, but him being a professor at Wazoo, in 1997, the summer, summer pre-doctoral institute program, where because of that interaction and later being introduced to James Anderson at the 1998 Philadelphia conference at HES, that made all the difference in the world. Of course, there's countless of other mentors within the society, but how that marks important points in our lives, obviously colleagues, to have great colleagues around. I can't say enough, right? And to be able to share this moment with somebody like Chris Ban, it's been really, really pleasurable. Also graduate students. And uh, I have quite a bit of graduate students, but it's okay. But that's also by design. And that was a deliberate way that I really wanted to share in these moments uh, because of what I was able to receive, I wanna be able to share in that. But also the institutional support systems. We. To, for us to be able to hold this important conference, right, at the U of I with the technical support that we've had. Our uh, IT partners team, again, thanking tremendously the support and the help of people like Adam Rush to be able to do this, be there 24 seven, literally. And for the help of our students, Nathan Tanner, Dr. Francina Turner, who finished, but who has gone on to wonderful things. It's been a wonderful way that they've helped from my program chair to how they're doing that now. And Rakaya Williams Perkins, who helped this in that transitional process. It's also acknowledging this place where we are at the University of Illinois as a land grant institution and the background that you see where I'm providing this presidential address, but in particular in recognition of the various native nations of Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankasha, Weya, Miami, Moscouton, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. We are here as a nation, as a land grant institution because of those contributions and the lives that made this possible. So, in a way to begin, speaking truth to power and acknowledging where we need to go. I'll share a little story of how this came to be, right? And that evening rituals in our household often comprise of certain members delaying the inevitable of getting to sleep, to which I'm sure many of you can relate. For some reason, my children have used such downtimes to, to engage in the more probing existential questions about the meaning of life and more often than not, why racism, sexism, and inequality persist in our society. My initial responses have been met with a typical letting out a big sigh 
and asking them, why couldn't you ask these questions during the day or dinner time when ample opportunities existed? Despite all that, it has become a tradition that I've come to cherish, albeit tinged with exasperation. So one evening, two years ago, my children then ages 14 and 10 discussed daily occurrences in their respective schools where they observed disparate treatment against mainly African American students by teachers and school administrators. This particular evening, as I proceeded in my usual manner of attempting to explain the effects of educators being colorblind, all the while operating with implicit biases, I noticed that my son was actually listening and processing, all the while growing just very angry. And as I continued in that professorial manner, he suddenly exclaimed out loud, they're not being colorblind, they're being racist blind. They're blind to their own racism. Well, I was certainly impressed by his astute analysis, where he revealed, at least to me in that moment, and the need to focus on systemic roots of racism, and especially in our teaching and in our educational moments, and where the colorblind ideology fell short. What he so aptly understood as a fourth grader was the seemingly benign nature of how claiming colorblindness excused one from owning systems of privilege and racism in everyday life. A 10-year-old, a 10-year-old pointed out why colorblindness was never an accurate way to describe the structural realities of inequitable school systems and those who have been educated and taught within. It is also to acknowledge the honest appraisals of our youth. And we have kids speaking back to us, speaking truth to power all the time. That I wanna focus on a way to decenter the language and thought of colorblindness towards recognizing racist blind mindsets and working to redesign our systems of practice. So in listening to a national public radio's TED Radio Hour on a topic by Debbie Millman, who is the chair of the MPS branding department at the School of Visual Arts in New York, titled Designing Our Lives, she revealed that societies and essentially our realities were built on foundations of design that were always intentional. That visual symbols have been attached to specific meanings about our cultural resonances throughout time and space revealed processes of group identity formation. In essence, this is how cultures are read and understood. And even though Millman was addressing the history of design through logos and branding and popular culture, I couldn't help but think of how our social structures were built upon the framing of storied identities through intentional design. It led me then to sociologist Joe Fagan's notion of the white racial frame. In the building and designing of US society built on systemic racism. And for introducing me to Fagan, I want to thank Angel Velez, who is one of our wonderful PhD students in history of education, looking at higher education experiences of Puerto Rican students in Chicago. And as Fagan writes here, right, the white racial frame is dependent on organized sets of racialized ideas, stereotypes, emotions, and inclinations to discriminate. This white racial frame generates closely associated, recurring, and habitual discriminatory actions. This, what we know, and I know that we know this too, is that there's nothing new to this historical framing, right? At least to us, but that the recent attention to systemic racism and inequality as what's trending, even among our colleagues in academe, it leaves me a bit befuddled here. In a sense, however, it is how the white racial frame has insisted on a racist blind and not a colorblind ideology to persist. Colorblindness is rooted in an assimilative structure that focuses on individual behaviors and choices without fundamentally addressing the power and racial differential habitually reinforced on a daily basis. And what in ways that Eduardo Bonilla Silva caused the colorblind racist acts that occur across time and space. The continued efforts, especially in education, to reinforce colorblindness as a form of racial neutrality. And we know there's lots of research 
on color blindness, color blind racism in educational research. But that, and thinking how the reinforcement of color blindness as a form of racial neutrality and societal advancement perpetuates racist blind thinking about the intentional design of our society to accept racism as a given and natural. And that to question efforts to be colorblind as all things equal and neutral is a racist act in and of itself. And certainly we have these historical examples that we can point to. And one of the things that I point to is looking at intergroup and intercultural education examples in the Seattle Public Schools, for example, in the 1950s, where there was a vote to not provide Negro History Week because it would incite racial division, but yet at the same time, promoting the use of minstrel shows because it provides a cultural contributions approach. Now those in itself are the very things that we also need to interrogate. And it's also what critical race theorist and legal scholar Derek Bell has written exclusively and extensively on in terms of the permanence of racism in our legal and social systems and that the cloak of color blindness continues to stall any traction towards racial progress. And to be sure, colorblind and racist blind coexist, but that the constant inattention to a system of racist structures inscribed in our laws, policies, and social customs maintains that discrimination is individual and personal, not systemic. And contributing to a racist blind system built on the white racial frame can also be seen as an extension of racial formation advanced by sociologists Michael Omi and Howard Winant. Their book on, of the same title highlights the significance of the category of race as a social construct and that it is shaped and reshaped over time, depending on the particularities of the social, political, and economic landscape. The process of racial formation is produced through racial projects like schools and that become inscribed and practiced through our everyday customs and interactions. What is pervasive to reiterate Dr. Bell's argument is the way race and racism shapeshifts to maintain whiteness as the default structure of standard operation. And here I'm reminded of the citizenship cases of Takao Ozawa and Bhagat Singh Tind, where arguments over racial classification of whiteness and Caucasian status was contested and lost. Racism and whiteness, as historian Erica Lee notes in her new book, America for Americans, also operates within the history of xenophobia in the US and the ways it becomes entangled with who is deserving of citizenship. And certainly that the foundation and design of our society was built on the global slave trade as a matter of history and record. Historian Andreas Resendez and other scholars such as Manisha Sinha detail how colonial territorial expansion became fueled by the other slavery as he would note, with the enslavement of indigenous populations throughout the Caribbean, South and Latin America, of course, including Mexico, and then expanding into the US territories. Such scholarship reveals how the US is not unique in this regard, but also points to how entrenched systemic racism was, in the words of Ibram Kendi, stamped from the beginning. But how these facts of history are still shunned and shied away by educators, paralyzed, by white fragility, as noted by Rama D'Angelo, for example, in teaching about our nation's past poses an imminent threat to building democratic ideals and citizenship. And here, W.B. Du Bois, Carter G. Woods, and James Baldwin make this painstakingly clear in confronting our racist past and present within our public school systems. Du Bois, in his essay, does the Negro Need Separate Schools, published in 1935, nearly two decades preceding Brown versus Board of Education, offers a cautionary tale as well as an indictment of Northern schools and institutions of higher education, where the operationalization of de facto segregation reveals a condition so harmful to African-Americans that attaining what he notes, a proper education in that current context would never be achieved. Du Bois knew full well that the system of the white racial frame in a future desegregated South would yield devastating results of the loss of an educated workforce of tens of thousands 
of black teachers and administrators and the lives of nearly 4 million school aged children that would come with dire consequences for generations. So then, is it really a surprise? Schools are doing exactly then what it was designed to do. And for this quote, James Anderson would always talk about this as the way that David Tyak, when he was a faculty person at the University of Illinois before going on to Stanford, would often say that schools are doing exactly what it was designed to do whenever questions about inequality, inequities, all those things would come to bear. And in a sense, yeah, schools were intentionally designed to be unequal. It's not something we want to hear, and this is not something we might exactly want to teach to our bright-eyed, bushy-tailed students, right? But that schools were intentionally designed to be unequal, conditioned to accept the white racial frame as a given and natural, and what James Anderson would term as education for citizenship and education for second class citizenship. And how we have designed schools in this way, and also as expressed by scholars over the years. And here I point to just a few, because I know that every one of us here has done important work in this regard. But for example, with the design and the teaching of schools within systems of a settler colonial mindset. And I will get to forms of how we even teach as those who teach history of education. And I'm still guilty of this too. And I need to think through that process. But yet from the building, as Carl Kessel would note in the building of common schools from a pan Protestantism perspective that built into that system is that we really don't talk about controversial issues in the schools. Now, that those similar sentiments certainly seem to resonate even for today. We don't talk about controversial topics. We can't talk about race. We can't talk about this. We can't talk about that. It's getting better, I know, because I have students who are teachers in the schools, who are administrators doing so much to do that racial equity work that is important. But yet, what I hear often is, I'm the only one doing this in my school, in my building. And to hear that is still disheartening on so many levels. And it's also how we tend to silence, and I'll also get to this too in a little bit, and how we have worked within these grand experiments in our history to have indigenous populations, for example, to fit within this white racial frame. And then is it also no surprise that elements of our demographics of our teachers have not changed all that much. There is promising hope with more Latinx teachers coming into the fold, but yet it still doesn't change all that much from a hundred years ago. And even some of these historical efforts that I've been able to bring back up and in California, for example, there was a teaching workforce study done in the 1950s to ask, all right, what must be done to diversify the teaching force? And uh, in collaboration with the Pacific Coast Council on Intercultural Education, there it was in the process of doing that study. There were some recommendations that were made. However, I go back a decade prior to that in the San Diego Unified School District, where the hiring by then superintendent Will Crawford of the one black female teacher for the whole school system was met with such protest and resistance, again, of the one lone black female teacher. That is also part of this tradition and part of what our school systems have been designed to do. And within that too, over time, what have we been teaching our future teachers? What courses have not been able to be taught, especially over the last couple of decades, I would say. Of course, again, I point to examples that occurred within intercultural education and the work of Rachel Davis Du Bois and what Lori Johnson and I have written about in other publications. But that we realize too, a lot of this is about 
changes in teachers' attitudes. It wasn't really necessarily about changing school systems. And that's where it's taking me to a place to go through the primary sources again to provide a different kind of read that is important to do. The other important elements to note in schools doing exactly what it's designed to do is that it's hard to change these systems. And even with these, what I would call ancillary or alternative pathways to teaching, we've tried that with the National Teaching Corps. We have the Grow Your Own right now, Call Me Mister, Teach for America, highly contentious. But how and what ways these programs have developed, it still doesn't change the structure of our school systems and how and who we admit into our teacher education programs. The other point too, and again, to invoke David Tyak and Larry Cuban, are we really, were we really ever tinkering toward utopia? I mean, isn't this tinkering toward dystopia, right? Tinkering dy toward dystopia in the sense, well, this is also because in this pandemic moment, I've been, my, my family and I have been watching a lot of dystopic movies, right? All the variations on a theme and their counterparts as well. But it got me to thinking, I mean, how is this ever working towards utopia? Of course, Cuban and Tayak lay out a much more complex argument than that. But it also got me to think in these ways, right? How have schools and colleges of education? I work in a college of education. How have we been maintaining white racial frames and racist blind practices in what it is that we do, right? So in terms of our teaching, I don't know that too many of us might go before 1619 or 1620, but yet to think and think broadly about the meanings of schooling and education, not just for the colonial Northeast of America, but throughout the Americas, if you will, and how and in what ways indigenous cultures and populations have worked through notions of education and schooling. Those points being very important and particular. The other element is also the historical development of normal schools and teacher education. And in the ways that we teach about teachers and in the way that we research about teachers. And I'm so grateful to have sat in on the session yesterday with Lauren Lefty and James Frazier to talk about their new uh, two volume book, which I will be encouraged and inspired to read, but also leading back from the research conducted by people like Jurgen Herbst and Chris Ogren, David Labrie, Kate Ruminier, and so many others to remind us of the lower status origins of teacher prep programs in normal schools and within colleges of education and how even the newer works with somebody like Christina Collins in New York City, uh, Black teachers, in terms of how this notion of being ethnically qualified renders less than perspectives, pr provides this notion that these barriers of meritocracy, right, is a way to be a gatekeeper for who can get in to colleges and schools of education and to become a teacher. I'm also referencing here the uh, book by Julie Gorlewski and Eve Tuck in their edited collection on who decides who becomes a teacher and working towards this immense state system to work through the new kinds of regulations that are out there and in ways that really provide examples, and I would say powerful examples, but I would also note the ways that we can learn from that to apply also historical understandings where that need to take place. So the other point that we come here, and I want to get us to, is what if we really work and get to this point of trying to understand what research would look like or could look like. And for this moment, um, I have also with the help of uh, Sharon Lee and Jennifer Ng, who's at Kansas, and uh, Xavier Hernandez, who's at UC Irvine, other former great Illinois grads, we've worked to contest these notions of binaries and racialized binaries. 
So within this, right, I ask, why do we continue to buy into the white racial frame in research? What do I mean by that? Well, we still like to create forms of binary thinking. And currently, and, and I get this, I get why, but does it have to be that way? That's also my question. We have this black brown versus white Asian academic achievement binaries that we set up. And ultimately I'm asking whose interest does this serve, right? Because I'm calling for us to think even more complexly and interrelationally in these ways. And here, when I'm talking about interrelationally, I also uh, am hearkening back to the days in my philosophy of ed courses uh, with Hans Georg Gadamer and this notion in truth and method that we are already related. That's pretty powerful when you think about that. We are already related. Well, if we take it from that standpoint and think about these, this interrelationality of how we are, what does it say and what does it mean when we say that Asian, Asian American students are successful? It also means that we have rendered other groups of students to be unsuccessful. And those who become successful then are the exceptions. And it's also that language of exception, uh, exceptionality and exceptionalism that I know that we have contested well in history of education. Well, why does it, in some ways, it may not be as direct, but implicit in current educational, contemporary educational research. And that to keep emphasizing the point that what was always normative within minoritized communities, academic achievement was always a norm. And so it's also, and Chris Ban has also done this well in a teacher's college record, um, uh, publication with Ishwanzia Rivers, another one of our great uh, graduate students. So I ask for why do we do that? Because we continue to create these false binaries, which then students who come into my class buy into this notion that as an Asian American student, well, of course, they're naturally more superior than African American or Latinx students and buy into this false binary to always buy into these notions of who's better and who's not, but how much of our historical understandings need to be made more manifest in that way. And also how that feeds into the growth of, of now an understanding of anti-Black racism that has other global repercussions with this. The other thing too, and I just mentioned this because it's the way that the language is framed and the words and the phrasing. I am not a quantitative methodologist and I doubt I will ever be one, but I also am very troubled by some of the ways in which language surrounds this notion of statistical insignificance. Now, when I first heard it, <laughs> how can you render groups of students statistically insignificant. Now, I know I have spoken to quantitative analysts and they have told me why this phrase occurs. Even though that's the case, does it have to be that way? That's my other question. And this typically happens when we talk about and reference uh, the underrepresentation of uh, racial minority students in STEM fields and in higher education, and that we don't typically include American Indian students into that fold because it renders it statistically insignificant. I'm sorry, but that to me is unacceptable. We have to figure out a new way to rephrase that. And I'm sure there are smart people who are doing it, but that is another example. Why do we accept that? Just because the laws of quantitative analysis or statistics says so? I really beg to differ on that. So it's also to say that the design and framing of language matters because also how we've monolithically framed Asian Americans without really still disaggregating the important elements and understanding the experiences of underrepresented Southeast Asian American students, for example, in that light. But scholars such as Stacey Lee and one of our other great graduates, Kristen DePau, who's been doing this, really then reveals the 
the deep layers and complexities of how students experience schooling in these very gendered, raced ways, class, all these different elements that come into play. So I know I'm not here about just kind of complaining about everything. <laughs> I like to, I like to have solutions. I like to have possibilities, right? So even given this, I want to do a little exercise here, right? And actually, I'm, I believe I'm violating one of the cardinal rules of historical training, right? Because even in undergraduate history courses, we're told you never want to go into what ifs of history. But, you know, people do that all the time. But why not? Because that is the place where we can design new ways of thinking. So here I'm asking us to reimagine, to redesign a new educational reality. So what if we maintained the black teaching force post Brown era, even a fraction of the nearly estimated 40,000 educators? Right? What if we kept a fraction of them? But what if we kept all of them? What would that mean? Right? So based upon Du Bois's estimation, that pretty much breaks down to one black teacher for every 37 African American students at that time. That's pretty powerful. My kids have yet to have a black teacher. Well, except for one, thankfully in an AP US history class. But to go through 12 years of schooling and to have had such little exposure to, uh, to teachers of color, that requires reimagination. And what would it look like if every child were to receive a proper education? And this is where we go back to, we always go back to Du Bois, right? And here's how he would, he talks about proper education as sympathetic touch between teacher and pupil, knowledge on the part of the teacher, not simply of the individual taught, but of his surroundings and background and the history of his class and group. And that such contact between pupils and between teacher and pupil on the basis of perfect social equality, as will increase the sympathy and knowledge, facilities for education and equipment and housing and the promotion of such extracurricular activities as will tend to induct the child into life. That the design of a school system be culturally relevant and responsive, right, in today's terms, for grounding the needs of the student by a well-trained teacher who is vested in the whole life of the child and their community it's been well documented in contemporary educational research. We can look to people like Gloria Latson Billings, Jackie Jordan Irvine, Michelle Foster, Richard Milner, and Tyrone Howard. But this was also provided nearly a century ago, right? And that also raises additional questions for me. It has come to bear more recently, I would say, in the last decade and a half or so. But from the very beginning, how is Du Bois not recognized as a central intellectual figure in educational theory and thought, like John Dewey, who wrote his experience and education and of educative and miseducative experiences around the same time? Thankfully, we have Derek Aldridge's The Educational Thought of W.E.B. Du Bois and Intellectual History, which provides an important corrective in centering Du Bois within education. And to reposition Du Bois' question of, does the Negro need separate schools? I would add this. Why do we persist on providing an improper education to our students of color? Why do we persist? Why are we willfully operating within a deeply flawed system? Again, you might be wondering, why are you biting the hand that feeds you? Well because I can, that's why, right? But honestly, why do we do this? And why is it so hard? What does it have 
be so hard, right? And here I go to lean on James Baldwin's A Talk to Teachers, published in 1963, reminding us in the opening paragraphs of, the, of his essay, and of course, amidst growing civil unrest, for teachers to take seriously what it means to teach for democratic civilization versus barbarism. That while on the one hand, education's ideal is to spring forth individualistic thinking and identity development, but that on the other, society has been designed to quell those who actively seek it. And he writes, right? But no society is really anxious to have that kind of person around. What societies really ideally want is a citizenry which will simply obey the rules of society. If a society succeeds in this, that society is about to perish. The obligation of anyone who thinks of himself as responsible is to examine society and try to change it and to fight it at no matter what risk. This is the only hope society has. This is the only way societies change. And he's speaking about this from a revolutionary standpoint, but how it begins with a reimagining of how things can be. And Baldwin's call to action to arm ourselves against racism, against continued violence aimed at black bodies and minds, and to make explicit how the system of inequality has been designed to maintain the white racial frame, including our schools, that it must be dismantled. Otherwise, we face extinction. In more contemporary thought, uh, Baldwin's words would extend to here, I would hearken to Maxine Green, who would note of needing to learn to think otherwise. Learning to think otherwise, where the power of hopeful, imaginative thinking forms the basis and necessity for human flourishing. Baldwin brings this notion to bear obviously decades earlier, to underscore that humanity's survival depends on what I would phrase as teachers teaching to be otherwise, or the need to do that. But yet, how many of us teaching in teacher education and other licensure programs see this reflected in the day-to-day -day operations of our programs? How much time and energies are spent in efforts to comply with state regulations that are also so deeply flawed? And again, I'm reminded of the Lauren Lefty and James Frazier session and Jackie Blunt talking about she was still recovering from the trauma of all these things that she had to do, right? What danger still lurks if we were to take Du Bois and Baldwin seriously to redesign school systems to be otherwise? And here I thank those researchers in our society since the late 1980s into the 90s and now who have been researching otherwise because we would not know of the kinds of macro and micro histories that we have now of different racialized groups, ethnic groups now with more and more LGBTQ research. This is exciting and this is needed and this is why we will be a flourishing society. But also, it is only through this kind of continued researching and researching to be otherwise can we reimagine new possibilities with that. And this is where I come to this place here, where I'm obviously still working through this, even though I will tell you the story. I've been with this for 20 years. It's still in its preliminary phases. And what do I mean I've been with this for 20 years? Well, when I was a very new assistant professor, uh, I, and during lunch, a, uh, an office worker in the educational placement office came up to my office during lunchtime and taking out under his shirt or a series of microfiche, right? Some of you know very well what microfiche files are. And I was, I looked at him like, what, what is this? And he said, take a look. And of course, I have to hold it up to the light to see what in the world was so valuable about it. And when I looked at it, I noticed in those microfiched images, faces of students of color. And I said, well, 
what is this all about? Well, he said these were files that I was entering and recording their data that they're going to be burned. They have been accepted to be burned at the university's incinerator because they were taking up this and a host of other historical records of teacher placement files. We're taking up too much valuable office space. And to that, of course, what do I do with these documents that were destined for erasure, destined to be burned? And how do I talk about this? And how do I research this? And so I've held on to them for a good 20 years. In the meantime, trying to do as much intermittent research on this as much as I could. Now, the reason why I was able to get these leftover files and what he thinks were about the uh, all of the students of color that he could find at the time that he could visually see because they weren't recording this in their database. And the reason why I was able to get them because this person was a volunteer research assistant for me for a number of years and who happens to be my spouse. And so he knew the value of this type of historical material. And so thankfully, if he weren't there, I would never know about this. I would never have a way of finding out about these students destined for erasure, which of course then asks these questions of how many other types of cases are there like this, right? And so I didn't know how to conduct research on subjects who weren't supposed to be written about from documents that were not housed in, effect, in officially sanctioned spaces. It seemed methodologically daunting at the time as an assistant professor whose tenure, tro whose tenure clock would not have supported the longer time it would take to work through these challenges. But I've had great research assistants throughout the time. Erica Davila, who was my first PhD student, now a professor at Lewis University in the Chicago area. Janie Wu, as a master's student, who held incredible intellect and research skills, who's now in Chicago. And Yolanda Davis, who did a great deal of work and who is now the associate director at the Summer Principals Academy at Teachers College, Columbia University, and employing really what I thought was a novel approach at the time, about 10 years ago, through Ancestry.com. Right? And I remember uh, Cabria Baumgartner's session where somebody also talked about the importance of looking at uh, something like Ancestry.com to do that. Well, in, this, in these cases, right, I would also say the passage of time does afford certain advantages of perspective and wisdom as one also ages with the research. This is a great essay for someone. How do we also age with the research that has yet to be done, right? And my own process of reading the students' files, it changes over time and in different ways. And I ask more questions as I read through them. And hopefully I will have that time in this space to be able to do that, but hoping that it doesn't take another 20 years. But it's also helped by conversations that I have with colleagues like Span and Anderson, when uh, and Anderson in particular, because he's been at the University of Illinois for a third of the university's lifespan. I know he doesn't like to be reminded of that, but given that wealth of knowledge, right, uh, and his understanding of how faculty at the university and the College of Education, what were their inclinations? It made me then ask different questions about the professors who might have supervised and who taught some of these students. And it also questioned my judgments about the past as well. My own levels of binary thinking that we've been educated under, right? From undergraduate years again, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the rise and fall of this and that, right? It's not to decry those rise and fall thesis, right? But it's really, uh, how do I, how do I also work through um, having felt always uneasy with grand sweeping generalizations and claims, even though I could be doing the same thing right now, right? But that in rereading the data about our Illinois pre-service teachers, obviously more questions and uncertainties remain. And obviously, who were these students? Did they all become successful teachers? Who were the professors working with them? 
Were they guided by the faculty, right? Were they guided by socially progressivist ideals? Certainly we had a strong progressive education association presence, but yet how and in what ways did it come out? I don't now at the time when I was at the archives at the at the U of I, it was not a pretty sight, let's just put it that way. It's going through uh, a tremendous redesign in and of itself. But the question that I keep coming back to is, why did they come to Illinois? Of course, that's not the way I, I questioned it at the time. It was more like, why the hell would they come to Illinois, right? But again, maybe that questioning will be different because we're talking about the 1930s and the 1950s. And we're talking about some of this quick data that I would show you here, who some of these students are. Now this isn't, this is about 20 of the 31 total that I have, but just, you can just get a quick visual rundown analysis of who some of these students were, right? And where they came from. So the date first is really not when they were born, but when they were at the University of Illinois based on the teacher placement files. And you would note the African American students a male and female were between the years of 1934 and 1936. And with Japanese American, other Asian uh, students being in the mid 1950s, but with a with an exception of a student in his files would note having come from Java. And all these different individualized histories that are important to bear and physical education being an interesting area for why somebody who would come from Honolulu, Hawaii to enroll in our physical education program. So obviously all these incredible questions maintain. But here I wanna focus a little bit on the Japanese American students whose origins obviously are from the West Coast. And especially if we look at those coming from Washington and California, describing their families' experiences from evacuation camps, as they would call it, during World War II. Some were more explicit about it than others. Others would say that they lived their time in Arkansas, for example. Um, but here, while the description of their wartime experiences do not provide great detail, their personal statements reflect general interest in why they wanted to teach and in what subject areas. Certainly the effects of wartime trauma, as well as not airing one's grievances are important features to consider in their basic statements, but it can also be interpreted as a means to focus on who they wanted to become as a teacher and why. The purpose of teaching for one Nisei female in the early 1950s was clearly formed by her experiences being born in Long Beach, California, and then being relocated to four years behind barbed wire in Denson, Arkansas, then resettling to Des Moines, Iowa, and finally to Chicago. And the other important element, the historical element to this is the bulk of contemporary research that looks at why aren't there more Asian American teachers in our school systems, because it is still, I believe, less than 5% overall. There are all of these other kind of cultural markers. And there's another essay that I need to finish on why is it always about culture when we talk about Japanese American or Asian American um, students uh, in the, going into the teaching profession. It's always based on a cultural argument and not necessarily on a structural argument that looks at structural inequality. And so here we have these historical examples where there are these future teachers desiring to enter and also how they talk about what they wanted to do in the classroom. And so this Nisei female educator, Nisei as a Japanese American second generation, she writes it, I think it's very important and this is in her personal statement. I think it's very important for children of different nationalities to experience playing and working together. If this is not possible, the teacher should guide the children into a study of different people. Perhaps from this study, racial prejudice, which is most often learned at home, will be overcome. I would want each child in my class to feel that he is important and capable of many things. This could be partly achieved through a joint teacher pupil planning of what to study. Each child should be allowed to express what he would like to study. 
I want to make school so interesting and exciting to each child that he can't wait to get to school. I want each child to feel that I am his friend, a friend learning with him. So then the questions of, how did she develop this perspective? Was it from her coursework? And some of these students, they had coursework in social foundations of education, history of education, and philosophy of education, more so in the 1950s, but some in the 1930s. Were they the sentiments that would have been expressed by faculty? Or was it their field placement experiences, having experienced such racial animosity that she developed this notion and teaching philosophy? And I would say quite boldly, right? Quite boldly. Now the supervisors statements about this teacher, they offer very little in the sense of analysis, mainly because they, could, they provided stereotypical statements such as she is a quiet, steady worker. She is very quiet and reserved, not inclined to talk much, but do know that she is very studious, conscientious person, entirely dependable in whatever she undertakes. Some were like that, some were a little different. But if we go back to African-American students for a little bit and where I will do uh, more analysis on that, but it also provides important context, especially if we focus on somebody, uh, the African-American male who received his PhD at the University of Illinois in the 1930s and who received his bachelor's from Howard University as a Rosenwald Fellow. And the background in STEM fields, I believe I was able to locate his dissertation in a publication, but that the desire to be a university faculty, to be so strong. And so then the next thing is to really, he was able to get a faculty position, but probably not the kind of institution that would be on par with the education that he received. And so reading his file and other files, I would say that they were overwhelmingly overqualified. And this is to counter this notion historically, right? They were not ethnically qualified. They were overly qualified in what they were able to do and how they were able to teach. And that some had multiple language skills to be able to teach in elementary, junior high schools. They didn't have junior high, junior high back then, but to have these kinds of skills and additional subject level expertise speaks greatly about not exceptionalism, but what is normal and how we term these normalization of understandings. So I'm almost close here. Thank you for bearing with me. So these are just some of the students that my teenager was able to provide a little collage of at the University of Illinois in the 1930s and in the 1950s. And just, I want you to take a little bit of time to look at these brilliant scholars because they represent so many who are not able, we don't know who they are. And still, of course, I still ask that question. Why the hell would they come to Illinois, right? But indeed, this is so significant. They're not insignificant, they are significant. And for those that we won't find, right? So I also constantly think about what do we owe future generations? And maybe this is something that we do as parents, right? Because we see so much reflected in, in our young when they're always asking us, gee, thanks a lot for screwing the world up, right? Now it's up to our generation to fix it. That is probably true. And so what do we owe to future generations? Where must we go from here? I offer some suggestions and recommendations. Of course, there's also not a shortage 
of all these different recommendations that are out now. But I also am really deeply committed to this notion that we, we can do things within our spheres of influence. And especially in our society, we have so many senior scholars who hold administrative positions. You can make these changes. It's not gonna be easy, but that's why we do this, right? We're not in it because it's easy. We do it because it's the right thing to do. Well, how do we confront our racist blind practices? Because this is also comes as a plea from our young people. Please do this. How do we assist in changing institutional policies and practices through research that is grounded in historical evidence? This is where our role comes in, right? And we also need to acknowledge and call it out for what it is. We know the history of standardized testing. We know that admissions requirements and policies are rooted in a white racial frame that really needs to start to dismantle in different ways. And it doesn't mean that quality isn't there. It's the way that we've been told what quality means in different ways. And we also need to think more intentionally. And even though Span Anderson, Bill Trent and I have written about this in the TCR article, right? We still need to be intentional with recruitment, retention, and the graduation of the students who we admit not only in our undergraduate, but in our graduate programs as well. And that we build in support systems along the way, knowing all the while that it's not perfect. It is not perfect. And I am hardly getting there myself, but how do we build this together? That we also continue to research and publish the complexities of our educational histories that mark, for example, transnational migration of bodies and ideas and how and in what ways it highlights colonial, imperial, power differentials. And certainly the last few years of HES award winners really bring this to bear. We also have a great generation of scholars that, you know, uh, well, I'm just gonna call out the Illinois folks as well. We have Melly Velasquez, Mario Perez, John Hale, Rich Benson. We have so many others who are uh, who have come into this fold who are doing important work in that regard. And I know I'm not naming everyone that I should name, so apologies to that, but how that's important. It's also, as being scholars in history of education, what I would also like for us to do is to own our academic identities as educators and historians. We have to resist these binary thinkings about, are we this or are we that? Do we need legitimation by the history discipline? I say we own who we are as educators and as historians and to resist the types of insecurities that might come from it. And that also means the kinds of graduate training we provide our graduate students. It doesn't do them any good to say that you need to be accepted as a historian from the history field. It really doesn't. But yet, how do we do better in a way that really centralizes the import of education? And again, I say this because of my social foundations training and background, where I hold that very dear. So where must we go from here, right? I know, stop laughing. No, I'm just kidding. But really, this presidential address comes at the commemoration of our society's 60th anniversary of the History of Education Society. And we've been thriving since 1960. And for me to be included among the most accomplished scholars on this momentous occasion is deeply humbling. To stand on the shoulders of such academic giants and with so many of you around here with us still, it leaves me with a great sense of responsibility and renewed purpose. And so as I close out the first life cycle of the history of education society, I want us to reimagine and research otherwise for the next 60 years as Chris Van starts the phase of the second life cycle of our society. And it's truly been an honor 
and to note that this is how a peaceful transition of power is done. All right. There you go. Right? And it was taken this morning. So thank you. Thank you very much.